On the surface level, Candyman is a brutal 90s slasher wrapped in magical realism and folklore. Born Daniel Robitaille, Candyman was a talented 19th century painter and the son of a famous black man who created a machine which could mass produce shoes after the Civil War. This gave Daniel time to practice his craft and aspire to the highest levels of education. He was later hired by a wealthy landowner to paint his daughter in the nude. Stricken by her beauty, Daniel and this woman fall in love. The woman later becomes pregnant by Daniel. Enraged by the fact that his daughter's purity had been smited by a 6'5 black man, the father ordered a group of thugs to cut off his right hand, covered his naked body with honey, while a swarm of bees stung him to death. His body parts were cut off and spread around the area where the Cabrini Green projects are in the film. This love affair and murder of Candyman both have roots in real life, as black men during slavery and Jim Crow would be lynched for having relationships with white women. Black men were also killed if they were falsely accused of raping, touching, or even flirting with a white woman, i.e. Emmett Till. After his death, Candyman reappears as an evil spirit who kills anyone who says his name five times in the mirror. Candyman. 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 In 1992, graduate student and protagonist Helen Lyle makes the hook-handed killer the topic of her thesis. Writing on urban legends, she discovers that a mythical figure called the Candyman is supposedly responsible for a string of murders in a Chicago housing project. She investigates Candyman past the point of no return, believing that she has disproved his existence. Candyman isn't real. He's just a story, you know, like Dracula or, or, or Frankenstein. Because she was a non-believer, Candyman reveals himself to Helen wearing a trench coat from Burlington Coat Factory and frames her for a number of murders. Candyman, like any serial killer, is obsessed with his legend. Your disbelief destroyed the faith of my congregation. Without them, I am nothing. So I was obliged to come. One thing I never understood about Candyman, though, is that he kills people who say his name to boost his number of followers, which I understand. But when he frames people who don't believe in him for murders that he doesn't directly commit, then how does that increase his kill count? How does that boost his credibility in the killer community? What is his PR team doing? Later in a weird series of events, Candyman pulls Helen in as his love interest for all eternity. Helen then dies after saving a baby from burning to death. She comes back to life as Helen, the Hellraiser, the White Widow, Candy Helen, Candy Lady, or Candy Kane, and kills her cheating ass husband. Seeing this movie as a kid had me running past mirrors and sleeping with the lights on for weeks. Some people are just made for a role and Tony Todd is one of those people. I can't visualize anybody else being Candyman. The fact that he would literally split people in two with a rusty hook is the stuff of nightmares. But perhaps even more frightening, than a hook-handed serial killer is the haunted home of Candyman, the Cabrini Green Projects, and the death of Ruthie McCoy, which the concept of Candyman appearing in bathroom mirrors is based on. On her way to investigate a supposed Candyman killing at the Cabrini Green Projects, Helen says, An entire community starts attributing the daily horrors of their lives to a mythical figure. These mythical figures could be swapped for racism, police brutality, Jim Crow, poverty, and no redlining. Concepts that seem so larger than life that they become urban legends with real consequences, believed or not. Victims of these monsters, ghosts, or practices are ignored only when the tragedy is so undeniable like George Floyd's death or so widespread like the opioid crisis does the mainstream believe in the boogeyman. According to allthatisinteresting.com, writer Morgan Dunn says, the Cabrini Row Houses and William Green Homes started as a solution to replace slums run by corrupt landlords with cost-effective and safe, comfortable public housing after World War II. Although the homes were appreciated by the residents, years of neglect, fueled by racism and bad press, turned them into the face of failure and poverty. Many black World War II veterans were denied mortgage loans, so they were unable to move to better areas. Because of redlining, black people were blocked from investments in public services. If they acquired a loan, white homeowners refused to sell to black buyers. This kept many African Americans from home ownership. This is a familiar story which belongs to many of those living in the projects throughout the US. This process of being ignored and abandoned belongs to Ruthie Mae McCoy. 
McCoy's tragic death is what the concept of Candyman appearing in bathroom mirrors is based off of. Ruthie was a black woman living in a similar project building to that of the Cabrini homes called the Grace Abbott homes, one of the most dangerous buildings in Chicago. The Chicago reader Steve Bulguera writes, McCoy had mental health issues and was labeled crazy. In 1987, McCoy called 911 saying that someone was coming through her bathroom. The police thought she was hallucinating, but she wasn't. After finally opening her apartment door a day and a half later, the police found McCoy dead. She was shot four times by burglars who climbed through a hole behind her bathroom medicine cabinet. Apparently in these projects, there were gaping holes behind the medicine cabinets that would allow a person to break into the connected neighbor's apartment. The irony here is that Helen realizes that her apartment building was built exactly like McCoy's. She even had a hole behind her medicine cabinet. However, her building wasn't abandoned by the housing authority. It was renovated and improved over time like the rest of her neighborhood. In fact, the apartments in her building had been changed to condos. One can find no better example in pop culture of what Martin Luther King calls the two Americas than this. Based on Ruthie McCoy, Candyman's first victim who lived in Chicago's Cabrini Green projects was named Ruthie Jean. She called 911 repeatedly saying, it sounds like someone is trying to make a hole in the wall. The police didn't believe her. They didn't respond until she was dead. Ironically, when speaking on the police response to these very same projects, Helen says, Two people get brutally murdered and the cops do nothing. Whereas a white woman goes in there and gets attacked and they lock the place down. According to the Chicago Reader, the brutal death and violence in the projects where McCoy lived fell on deaf ears. Babies had been thrown out of windows. Teenagers were shoved down elevator chutes. And intruders busting through people's apartments to rape and murder were an everyday occurrence. Unless there's something extraordinary about it, project killings just aren't news. This allows Candyman or the Candy Men to roam unchecked. The fact that the people of Cabrini Green won't say Candyman's name is a built-in no snitching policy. Equipped with a slow police response and no access to resources, the residents are all but living in a hellscape with no way out. Dunn writes, Towards the end of the 70s, Cabrini Green had become synonymous with violence and decay. This was due in part to its location between two of Chicago's wealthiest neighborhoods, the Gold Coast and Lincoln Park. These wealthy neighbors only saw violence without seeing the cause, destruction without seeing the community. The projects became a symbol of fear to those who couldn't or wouldn't understand them. Candyman is about a killer ghost who attacks people at their most vulnerable moments. Perhaps the real Candyman are the systems of oppression that hook people into poverty, danger, and desperation while stripping them of any opportunity to escape.